I have been privileged, I believe for the last several years, I'm not sure how many, to introduce our next speaker. I, I, I do count it a privilege. I sometimes sort of gloss over this, but I'd, I'd like to read this to you as, as it is written. It says, David P. Brown was born in 1946 in Camden, Arkansas, married to the former Joanne Anglin of Jackson, Tennessee. They have four children <clears throat> and 16 grandchildren. Brother Brown holds the BA, Master of Ed, and PhD degrees. He's been preaching for 48 years active in gospel meeting work and lectureships in and out of the United States, <clears throat> has engaged in several religious debates, has written for several religious journals, served as associate editor for the Christian Worker, served as co-director of the annual English lectureship and editor of the lectureship book, and presently serves as co-owner and editor of Contending for the Faith. <clears throat> he has done local work in Arkansas, Oklahoma, and Texas, served as assistant director of Turley Children's Home, Tulsa, Oklahoma, director of the Southwest School of Bible Studies in Austin, Texas, presently serving as the director and faculty member of the online internet school Truth Bible Institute. He is director of the Spring Church of Christ CFTF lectureship. He preaches for the Spring Church of Christ in Spring, Texas, a part of Greater Houston, Texas, where he and his wife have been members for the last 20 years. <clears throat> It's, uh, I guess, the last part I'm most grateful for, that he's with us here at Spring. We, uh, we count it a high honor to have him with us, to uh, break the bread of life to us on a weekly basis. And I think I do him no respect when I consider him to be a fine, fine gospel preacher and also a person who lives what he preaches. David, would you come speak to us, please, on the title, Christ, the Great Controversialist. I think one of the things that I've noticed about the elders and yours truly, in view of the fact we're just in two or three years of one another in age, <clears throat> we need all the memory help we can get. <laughs> and you know, buddy, uh, we were in our 40s 20 years ago. So all of you in your 40s now, <laughs> you see what you got ahead of you and don't think it'll be any better than us. <laughs> Folks, we're very grateful that we can continue to put on this lectureship. Let me emphasize that it goes, this influence goes far beyond these walls. It does so through the messages that are taught in the book. It does so through the CDs. It does so over the internet. And uh, it just continues to go. We need sound, solid lectureships like this more now than ever because a great many lectureships that once started out to be solid and sound and just have lost a lot of the cutting edge and willingness to deal with things that uh, bother the brotherhood. And you can deny they bother the brotherhood and be bothered by them, or you can realize they're false doctrines and do as the New Testament teaches all faithful Christians to do and deal with them. It's always going to be that way. There's no use trying to say we'll reach a stage on earth where it will cease being. As long as God's people are here, and they're God's people because they do God's will, then we're going to have to fight Satan. And he's going to do his fighting through men who preach, teach, and live false doctrine. False doctrine does not travel on the wind. We've had quite a bit of flu problems around since last uh, December, November. Various croups and coughs. Now that might travel on the wind, and you might get it by handshake. But false doctrine comes because people believe it, know it, and they stand up and teach it or write it. And it's going to have to be met. And to say, well, we're tired of hearing about false doctrine. Well, I admit we ought to teach the truth, but truth has a way of causing people who love error to get very upset when they don't intend to be changed by the truth. In looking at this lesson, Christ and the whole theme of the lectureship, the great controversialist, 
we need to ask, first of all, what is the meaning of controversy? And if you look at any good dictionary, it's going to be defined as basically a controversy is an ongoing dispute between at least two parties, but most often large groups of people where the subject is of an affecting nature, meaning whatever the subject is about, it has some kind of effect on the people of the dispute or on society as a whole. Now, you just think of Jesus and his work. You read of it, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and you will see just how that works. But let's ask uh, about the word controversial. It is defined tending to provoke or cause controversy by its nature. We'll put it together and think of Jesus. Jesus certainly tended to provoke or cause controversy by his nature. And there were certainly ongoing disputes concerning subjects having effect on the people of the dispute and on the society as a whole. You think of Jesus, if you know your Bible, when you think of controversy. The people who have learned to think of Jesus only as some sort of milk toast, just a big pushover, who you can pull anything on, have completely disregarded the facts of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John about Jesus Christ of Nazareth in the flesh doing what was necessary out of love to save our souls from sin. And we need to understand that. Jesus was bold and uninhibited in contending for the truth, denouncing sin. For after all, sin is the only thing, the only thing that can cause us to lose our soul. He also did not hesitate to point out a false teacher and mark a false teacher. One only needs to engage in a cursory reading of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John to see that Jesus did not tolerate error or those who advocated it and sometimes do a study of the word hypocrite as the Lord dealt with it and used it in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John and you'll see that he was especially upset at people who pretended to be something when they knew they weren't. Jesus spoke to the spiritual needs of the people he addressed. And thus, if he needed to say to broken hearts, consider the lilies of the field, how they grow, they toil not, neither do they spin. And yet I say unto you that even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. If he needed to develop that and show that God takes care of man's needs, if he seeks first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, then that's important. But there are also those people who despise the truth, who are disingenuous, who are just plain liars, and those who will change the truth into a lie. And he did not say unto them, consider the lilies of the field. They didn't need that. They needed something like, you have made my father's house a den of thieves. And he told them what they needed. Same Christ, same love for their souls. It always, as the great physician, he always dispensed the medicine that took care of the sin problem in that person's life. And he didn't pull any punches. Uh, sometimes I guess we read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John about the Christ, and we just don't see those things. But he just didn't pull any punches. He laid it out there. Same compassionate, loving, tender, kind Jesus who said, Come unto me all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and, and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and you shall find rest unto your souls. But there are those who don't consider themselves in sin. They don't know what sin is. They're living to suit themselves. They're self-willed, and they're selfish, and they're going to have their own way, and they're going to run over anybody that tries to stop them from from doing anything at all. And it's out there around us all the time. And frankly, I'm sorry to say, too much of it is in the church. Now there are some people who, especially historians who are disingenuous themselves, who would like to write history in the way they wish it had been. 
rather than do their best to find the facts of history on whatever subject or people it may have to do with. Well, there are those who approach the Bible the same way. And when it comes to Jesus Christ, there are those who refuse adamantly, though the facts are there in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, provided infallibly by the inspired writers, inspired by the Holy Spirit, that says that Jesus not only said, Consider the lilies of the field, but you made my father's house a den of thieves, and said it to the right people in the right way at the right time. And I'm sure his voice was modulated perfectly because he was perfect. Nevertheless, it was the truth said to them that they needed. But as men try to rewrite history according to what they wish it had been, then there are men who would like to make Jesus over into something the Bible does not re reveal him to be. And they redefine terms to do it, and love becomes simply a, message, a, 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 a mushy sentimentalism that is syrupy and allows for anything to go on, any belief to, to happen without bothering anybody. And the Lord just kind of sits there, looks like he's spaced out on dope and says, you're such a fine person. Now, that's the way a lot of people like to see him. You put anything over on him. He's just kind of in his dotage, walking in his rocking chair. And you ask him at the right time when he's half asleep, and he'll give you anything you want. And he may threaten you, but later on he's not going to remember it. And so he's going to bless you anyway. But you cannot, if you stay with the infallible, the inerrant, the all-sufficient, the final and complete revelation of God's Word, form that view honestly in your heart of Jesus Christ our Lord and our Savior. You can't do it. But remember, when you're ignorant of the Bible, then you're subject to being destroyed. As the prophet Hosea said, God's people had become in the long years ago. So as we look at Christ, we see that people have talked about, and you've heard this, about His love. And they don't realize that they've got to talk about the truth and give as much space to that as they do His love. They were not separate in His life. Jesus Himself said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto me or unto the Father. But by me, John 14, 6. So, he's love, but he's also truth. Love and truth go together. They are a part of God. You cannot think of God without thinking of love and thinking of truth. Thinking of truth, thinking of love. They are a part of the very divine essence of the one deity. As the essence of God is eternal, then love and truth are eternal. Thus, if you love me, Jesus said you'll keep my commandments. You can't love God and not keep his commandments. You can't do it. If you really from the heart have the love of God that the Bible teaches and says it's a must to possess it and cultivate it, then you're going to keep his commandments. And to say that you, John says, that you love God without keeping his commandments. And here's some very plain inspired language from an apostle, the one whom Jesus loved. He says, you're a liar. And the truth's not in you. Isn't that interesting? You love, you love the truth. You can't say, I love the truth and not do his will. So love and truth are not mutually exclusive as this world tends to say. Because it says, well, love is of such a nature that if you really love somebody, you're not going to hold them uh, as they're responsible to know the truth. You're just not going to do it. Uh, one is eternally present with the other. And you know where? It's in the very essence of the one God. Thus, in God, it's impossible to have love without truth or to have truth without love. If you say that you're cultivating the love the Bible says that we have that's like Christ and God, then guess what you're also cultivating? You're cultivating the desire for the truth. And you can't do one without the other. Because love and truth are of God's essence. And because they're of His essence, guess what? He cannot lie. Thus all love and all truth come from Him and from no other source. Now listen. When the eternal word became flesh, love and truth became flesh. And because Jesus Christ is the truth, 
everything that pertains to the nature of truth pertains to Jesus. John 14, 6. Thus, as he said of himself to Pilate, listen to him, talking about his death, to this end was I born. Now listen. And for this cause came I into the world that I should bear witness unto the truth. Everyone that is of the truth heareth my voice. John 18, 37. Well, what if you compromise the doctrine? It's going to reach people that are not of the truth. Because it's not the truth anymore. If a man's allowed to define his terms to suit himself, he can uphold anything to be true. And if you'll watch false teachers, they're either going to change the definition of terms, or they're going to make up new words and give them their own definitions. Every one of them will do it. You may have to study a little bit to see it. All you've got to do really is just look at the usage of love and its definition, and you'll see how corrupted it is. Or the importance of truth. Look what men have done to that. They've said, well, truth is subjective. Truth is relative. In other words, it just goes with the flow, and whatever you think it is, that's what it is. That's not what the Bible teaches about truth. And in our age, with so many people turning away from the Bible and its influence falling away day by day from our whole society and culture, when years ago it used to dominate pretty much all of it, then we're going to need to start emphasizing things like this to get people back in gear. This morning on some program on CNBC, I just happened to turn across it and I, it caught my ear and I listened. As to whether these things are very accurate or not, I don't know, but there has to be some amount of accuracy in them. But they've done a survey about people voting in the last election. And they say, understand I put that in quotes, they say, according to this survey, for whatever it means, that most of the people from 30 and below can't understand why people are so upset over homosexuality. When I think for a minute, 30 and below. Go back 30 years. Think of their parents and the way things were then. People not too much caught up in religion. Might darken the door of some sort of religious institution, house, somewhere. But then also 30 years ago, concerted efforts were being made on every level of our society. Not just in the educational institutions, but throughout our society to start educating the babies, you might say. In uh, things like this not being a big deal. We're in America. It's free if I think they're crazy. But don't you think they ought to be free to do whatever it is they want to do? And that's what they've been educated. Because we don't teach anymore even secular matters that pertain to where our country came from. The principles it's founded upon. The people and so on. We've changed all that stuff. So if man's allowed to define his terms to suit himself, he can uphold anything to be true, and he'll change you. Education changes people. I sat in a class one time where one of the professors was saying, there he is up there teaching to convey knowledge, supposedly to make people look at things differently, and said, we don't change people. I said, what are you doing right now? And this was a class of people who were principals, superintendents, and teachers and I said, are, are you real absolutely sure that what you just said wasn't designed to change my mind? Or at least you hoped it would give me a different view from what I might have? And a teacher sitting in the back said, huh, that's sort of like saying never say never. <laughs> Nothing was else was said. The professor never answered me. He just went on to another subject. And that's the way these people have of dealing with anything we challenge them on. They give you a very... Uh, Oh, you know, I'm more knowledgeable than anybody else on earth, and you're a peon, and you're a nothing, and you're a dumbbell, so that's my answer. That's no answer, but the whole country and the world has been taught that answers you. They don't deal in facts. We do not live in a world that deals in facts. Jesus Christ, because he was the truth, and the nature of facts and its relationship to truth, had to deal in facts. So many facts that we couldn't know, but he being God in the flesh could reveal about the Father. So when he said of himself, when you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Not that you see a fleshly body. The Father, first person of the Godhead, doesn't have a fleshly body. But he meant in his teaching and his life and his thinking and his conduct and the fruit he bore in this fleshly body. 
So when we read and hear what many teach about Christ, we know they've embraced modern definitions of such things as meekness, and I've already said love, uh, the idea of kindness and compassion and mildness and tenderness. They don't think you can be bold and frank and say this is just what a thing is if you're going to be full of compassion and, and if you're mild and tender. Well, I tell you now, the Bible reveals Jesus Christ to be as mild and tender and concerned about anybody as they could be. But is that all we're going to read in the Bible about Jesus, who was love and who was truth? And they don't contradict one another. They're all a part of it. It's just that the people, by what they thought, what they did, and how they lived, elicited from him what they needed to hear. And that's the reason he scathingly rebukes some. Woe unto you, scribes, Pharisees, and hypocrites. That's the same Lord of love and truth who said, Suffer little children and come unto me, for such is the kingdom of heaven. Suffer and forbid them not. Do you think we're talking about two different beings? Or is it that we have had such a false concept of kindness, compassion, and mildness that we cannot see it uh, where he scathingly cleans out the temple. Go back and read that. He, he made his own little whip. Turned over the money changers. Drove out everything. I, I don't see him just kind of tiptoeing through the tulips and humming along in flower song of the 1960s. I think animals and and. And everybody else is heading out the door as fast as they get there. The Son of God came to his Father's temple and cleaned it out. I don't ever hear of anybody trying to challenge him. He just cleaned it out. Now that's the same Lord that on the Sermon on the Mount taught all those pleasing things and said, Come unto me all you that labor and are heavy laden. I wonder sometimes if we don't really think, Well, that's one Jesus, but there must be another one over here somewhere. And we'll just pick and choose. We'll read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. We'll pick the one that smiles. And the one that uh, fits the modern definition of kindness and tenderness and mildness and compassion. But it won't work. All that means is we have defined those terms wrongly to where we can't see it fitting in with the Jesus who pronounced, Woe unto you, scribes, Pharisees, hypocrites, you generation of vipers. But it is the same Jesus. And he didn't change. He didn't sin. He's just what he ought to be. That's why he was the great controversialist. When he taught the truth, remember they said, I've been no man has ever taught like this. I get tickled sometimes in going back and thinking about some of my classes and some of these things people taught. And then uh, what it said about Jesus. He taught as one having authority. Not as scribes and others. What does that mean? Well, he had authority from God. He's the Son of God. He's the second person of the Godhead. By him were all things made that were made, and without him was not anything that was made. It was through his authority that the Father created everything. And so when it says he, by his, uh, he taught with one as one having authority, it's not like some teachers who will say, well, it seems to me, oh, you have another idea. Well, yeah, that's a little different from mine, but we could consider that. Uh, oh, you've got another one? Well, let's put them all together. Really, it doesn't make much difference on this as to whether you believe this. Now, now watch people. Baptism. Watch what they do. Well, yes, if you want to believe, you must be immersed in water uh, to, be to be saved from your sins. That's all right. But here, these folks over here, they're good folks. They're dedicated. They're pious people. But they don't believe you have to be baptized to be saved. And there's some folks over here that believe they ought to be baptized. But they think it's sprinkling water on their head. Well, who are we to say? They're good people. Now, where do you find the Lord ever teaching like that? On anything he said you must know and do in order to be saved from your sins. And yet, evidently, that to a great extent was what these people were used to. But our Lord said, verily, verily, I say unto you, and that's the way we do it. Verily, verily, mean comes to the same word, we get amen. So be it, so be it, I say unto you. That's what they meant by one having authority. They'd, he didn't have to go back and put in notes at the end of his chapter to show the sources he got it from. He was the source. And that's all there were to it. I don't think he would use, well, I won't say which one he would use as to the style sheet. I know what Ken would say about which one he used. It wouldn't be MLA. <laughs> so anyway, he didn't need any of that anyway. He was God in the flesh. 
And he spoke authoritatively. I say unto you, except ye repent, ye shall all likewise perish. Now, that's the same Jesus who's the great shepherd of the sheep and loves all of us and laid down his life for the sheep. So to them, these people today, many who think they're great servants of God, to them Jesus is an overly permissive parent. He'll give in to the badgering of his spoiled children's every demand. He's just a big pushover. And although he may threaten to punish his children or anyone else when they do wrong, in actuality, he never rebukes anybody. Or if he does, he won't follow through with it. If, if they will promise him they'll be good, whether they keep the promise or not, the final outcome is that he'll not punish them for the evil conduct. In fact, evil conduct, what is that? Now, you see, man has made Jesus over in his own image. For that's the way a great many parents operate with their children today. And a great many children now occupying places of authority in this country grew up under that. And that's the reason, as supposedly they are mature only in their fleshly bodies, they're immature in their minds. And thus, they continue to deal with all aspects of our country and business as simply spoiled brats. That's exactly what it comes down to. There's no use putting some sort of pretty varnish over it. They're simply saying, I want what I want, I want it now, I will pitch a fit. And uh, when you get a lot of power, some of those fits have people goose-stepping goose down streets and killing millions of people when they get into power. Meekness is simply not weakness. Its backbone is not that of some kind of wet, limp, and jellied noodle, warm though it may be. It took more strength than we can comprehend for the sinless Christ to become a man, to live on earth without sinning, confront hard-hearted, evil hypocrites of his own religion and his own race, men who had had hundreds and hundreds of years of being instructed by God to recognize their Messiah and their Savior, but he didn't suit them. So as Peter declared, they took him and with wicked hands crucified and slew him. But he was willing to endure so much at the hand of sinners all the time doing what was necessary to save the very ones that despised him. And finally, as you know well, to suffer a prolonged, shameful, and agonizing death on the cross. Love and truth in action. And presented in the revealed word of God on our level of understanding, if we will honestly receive it, so that we can be like Him too. And we're the spiritual body of Christ if we're Christians. And He's the head. Now, how do you think we ought to go about teaching and living? How should we deal with people in error? We should be able to discern between the per people who some haven't had opportunity, they don't know, they're beat down, they're cast down, and we should deal with them accordingly. Others are the beater downers and the stepper owners and the scrunch downers and the beat over the head. They ought to be dealt with according to them. But it's the truth. That is going to do with the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. Ephesians 6, 17. So, as we've said many times, as brother, the late brother and Franklin Camp said, Christ was not crucified for saying, consider the lilies of the field. But he was crucified for saying, ye have made my father's house a den of thieves. Our Lord could have preached for as long as he wanted to be on the earth. Consider the lilies of the field, and he wouldn't have stirred up any opposition. Now go back and read for yourself Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and see what stirred up opposition. See what caused men who should have been welcoming him in view of the position of the law of Moses as a schoolmaster to bring them unto Christ, Galatians 3.24, but they hated him. And the Old Testament writer said they hated him without a cause. Therefore, they had to manufacture whatever they had against him. And the main thing was they had power, so they didn't really have to prove anything. 
They just had to satisfy themselves just so they could put him to death. Even when the Romans tried to let him go through Pilate, what did they answer him? Crucify him. Crucify him. Love does not condone or defend sin or sinners, but reveals sin to be mankind's most vehement enemy. And those who engage in and promote it to be the enemies of the cross of Christ I don't care what they call themselves, but when they engage in it as if it's a great thing and label it to be something that it's not, they're not doing anybody a favor, not even themselves. As I say, people take terms, they redefine them, or they invent terms and give their own meanings to them in order to be able to give some authority to what they teach. But it doesn't change anything. Remember what Abraham Lincoln said? He said, if you have a dog... He's got two legs and a tail. How many legs does he have? Well, he has four. Well, what if we call the tail a leg? How many legs does he have? He still has four. Because the tail can be called a leg all you want to. It's not. Although some may very well believe. Listen, that false doctrine. Because God is love and Jesus is God, then Jesus did and does not condone any wrong. Well, then what does he do? He exposes, reproves, rebukes, and refutes all of it. He wouldn't be a God of love and truth if he didn't. Thus, in the life of the faithful child of God, the faithful member of the church of Christ, as that term is defined and used in the New Testament, love never attempts to make error as acceptable to God as is the truth. Or to compromise one teeny little bit the truth with error. But treats it for what it is. Error. False doctrine. A lie. Thus a loving Christian identifies. Because he walks in the step of Christ as authorized by the New Testament. Colossians 3.17 He rebukes, he refutes, and calls to repentance those who propagate error. False teachers and those living in sin. Warning the faithful of the error and identifying the false teachers. Now, you take that little comment and you go read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And you believe those words are telling you the truth about Christ and his work. And you see if that doesn't pretty much sum up all that he did as he went about teaching and went about doing good and working miracles to prove that he was a son of God. There are those today who will regularly try to change things. I came across this little article by James Hinkle and Tim Woodruff. And here's what they said, and I haven't got much time, but we'll try our best to cover some of it. As we study the example of Jesus in conflict situations, it is important to remember that in at least one respect, Jesus was very different from us. Well, I have no problem with that. He was always right. I have no problem with that. He saw the will of God absolutely and knew God's mind completely. That's absolutely right. Because I know the Bible teaches it. We, on the other hand, see but a poor reflection and can only know in part. 1 Corinthians 13, 12. Now watch him begin to take what he said that's true and begin to augment it and change it. Because he knows where he's going. Accordingly, certain aspects of Christ's conflict style are not to be imitated by his disciples. We cannot take the role of teacher and Lord as he could. Now, who is it that's a faithful child of God that thinks we can do as he did? Because he was sinless and perfect and knew the hearts of men. That's beginning to build uh, the straw man. These guys are cunning. We cannot speak. He says, with absolute confidence and omniscience. Now notice he lumps two things together. If you speak with confidence, it must be because you're omniscient. He didn't have any trouble writing these words confidently. I don't think they're omniscient. But he's made them fit together. If a fellow speaks confidently, trusting that what he says to be the truth, it must be that he knows all that the object of knowledge he has no right to hook those together because a person can speak confidently and not be omniscient. But he just asserts it. 
And if you don't read carefully, you'll swallow it because he's one of those sweet-smelling, big shot, come from a college, carrying a briefcase, preacher. We cannot see the hearts of others and know with certainty their motives as he and had the ability to do. Now let me ask you something. Where is there a faithful member of the church and all that the Bible defines faithful member of the church and faithful gospel preacher who ever said we could? But he's made our straw man. And so he's attacking that as if to preach confidently and say, you must hear the word of God. You must believe in Jesus Christ. You must repent of your sins. You must confess your faith in Christ as the Son of God. And you must be immersed in water by the authority of Christ into the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit to obtain the remission or forgiveness of your sins. Well, you see, that's pretty confident. So it must be that I'm omniscient. You know that, did you? I know my wife didn't. There are, he says, however... Some characteristics of Christ in conflict we would do well to imitate. Now let me ask you something. How does he know which ones to imitate and which ones not to? In particular, there are lessons for us to learn in the attitude Jesus took toward those with whom he clashed. At the heart of Jesus' conflict style, now listen to this, was a firm commitment to win people rather than arguments. Obviously, Hinkle and Woodruff absolutely know that we see but a poor reflection and can only know in part, 1 Corinthians 13, 12. It doesn't bother them from being so bold, frank, and full of all manner of candor and declare absolutely what they think. But I don't think either one of them, at least, they wouldn't admit it, think they're omniscient. It should be pointed out, though I must do this, that 1 Corinthians 13 verse 12 is Paul's explanation of how the infant church in lieu of the completed New Testament functioned under the direct revelation of the Holy Spirit. So he's yanked that verse completely out of context and applied it. The New Testament came in part and parcel. It was not the case that one day the New Testament was not on earth, but the next day the completed book was in the world. Paul is saying that God revealed the New Testament a little at a time as it was needed. So Hinkle and Woodruff's usage of this passage is completely out of context. But we do have the completed New Testament. And it has been here for about 2,000 years. James 1.25 of 2 Peter 1.3. Thus, these authors ought to have known better than what they wrote. With that error corrected then we could turn to other matters. He says, he, Jesus, was always right. Well, is it possible for a mere mortal to be absolutely right about anything? Evidently, they thought they were. For what are they writing down? Something they know is wrong? He saw the will of God absolutely, they say, and knew God's mind completely. Well, who is it that's claiming to know Jesus knows, knows as Jesus knows then or now? Who is it that's claiming omniscience? However, while Jesus was in his earthly ministry and before his death, even he had some things uh, that was withheld from him. For he said while he was a man on earth concerning when he's coming back at the end of the world, all the Father knows. What Hinkle and Woodruff would have us believe is that unless we can see the will of God absolutely and know God's mind completely, then we cannot make any absolute knowledge claims about matters of doctrine. And that's what they're trying to say all along. So anything goes. You can't believe anybody could really be lost because you really don't know absolutely the whole mind of God. And I guess they do. Certain aspects of Christ's conflict style are not to be imitated by his disciples. Well, if I had them here, I'd say, uh, give us a for instance. What are these aspects of his conflict style that are not to be imitated by his disciples? Obviously, it's not the way that they deal with error, that they think is error. Again, who is it that claims to know a person as Jesus fully and infallibly knew a person? Paul said to Timothy, and thus to all men, and that includes uninspired men, and the things that thou hast heard of me among many witnesses, these same commit thou to faithful men who shall be able to teach others also. 2 Timothy 2 verse 2. Now can men teach what they don't know, and can they know they don't know it? And do they have the ability to do what's necessary to know it? And when they come to the knowledge of it through study, know that they know it without being infallible or omniscient. But, of course, if they know something, then they can know that they know it and know it absolutely. And evidently, this is the way these fellows are because they have something to say. They say it very plainly. 
And thus they convey their knowledge to you and expect you to be persuaded by it. We cannot take the role of teacher and Lord as he could, whoever said that we could. But we can certainly follow his authoritative words set on our level of understanding. And he tells us that's what's going to judge you in the last day, John 12, 48. And Paul said, if we read what I wrote, you'll know what I know. But I suppose we can't do that unless we're omniscient. We cannot speak with absolute confidence and omniscience as he did. Well, speaking with absolute confidence, as I said, we can do. You don't have to be omniscient, knowing all that the object of knowledge, in order to speak confidently. Certainly they did. We cannot see the hearts of others and know with certainty their motives, as he had the ability to do. Well, since when does teaching someone the truth on anything require that we see the hearts of others and know with certainty their motives, as he had the ability to do? I certainly don't know your motives, unless you reveal it to me. How do I know everybody here is here for the right reason? So I can't preach. Until I know that you're here to learn the truth, better yourself, I can't preach. I've got to be like Christ. And know what Jeff's thinking about right now. What do you think about Jeff? See, I have to ask him that. And then I've got to trust him to tell me the truth. We won't go any further than that. There are, however, some characteristics of Christ in conflict. Uh, we do well to imitate. Well, I've talked about that. How do you tell the difference? And who are they to tell us which one's to and which one's not to? In particular, there are lessons for us to learn in the attitude Jesus took toward those with whom he clashed. Yes, read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and you'll see exactly what we've already said about his disposition of mind, his mindset toward the, those with whom he clashed. And we can take the attitude toward the truth that Jesus taught us to have, and we can imbibe it, we can know it, we can stand up for it, we can teach it, we can contend for it. And all that's taught is our responsibility as the church. We're going to close here, and I hope that this little cursory study will cause you to go back and read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And not try to read into it something that's not in the meaning of the words, but to get out of it only what our Lord recorded in it, so that we can truly understand why Jesus was the great controversialist. Thank you. Well, thank you, David, for such a fine lesson. I couldn't help but uh, think about the, the contrast that David drew between a all-knowing Christ and a bunch of know-it-alls. <laughs> you set the tone for the lectureship. We look forward to many more lessons. Let's uh, stand adjourned now until the top of the hour. Thank you.